Guilt and shame are two of the most toxic emotions that a human being can hold in their bodies. And if you're holding on to guilt and shame from something that happened in your past, I want you to know how much these emotions are harming you. But don't worry, because after watching this video, your days of holding on to guilt and shame are going to be over. In this video, I'm going to share my seven step healing process to help you shift out of guilt and shame once and for all. I'm so excited to help you take this load off your shoulder today, beautiful soul. So let's do this. Hello, beautiful soul. It's so good to see you. This is Christina Lopes, the heart alchemist here to help you open your heart, heal your past and live with purpose. In this video, we're talking about two really difficult and damaging emotions for the human system. And that is guilt and shame. I get a ton of emails from viewers and from former clients and, you know, people that want to work with me and they, they tell stories that are very similar. You know, some people say to me, you know, that they're struggling with guilt and shame because they did something to someone years ago and they don't know how to make amends. They don't know how to forgive themselves. They just don't know how to let go of the episode. I've had people email me, you know, people have emailed me that they've lost children to suicide and they feel really guilty about the things that they could have done possibly to prevent their child's suicide. Um, I get emails from people who are in deep pain because they just feel so ashamed of themselves and they feel guilty about something that happened in their past. And I know exactly how you feel. If you're one of these people that have sent me messages and emails about guilt and shame, I know exactly how you feel. I'm going to share a particular episode from my own life to kind of start off this video and help you, you know, um, identify the, the, the emotions, guilt and shame within you, because some of us don't even know that we're carrying guilt and shame for so many years and the level at with, at which we, we carry these emotions. So when I was 17 years old, um, I was really angry. <laughs> I was, I just had a lot of repressed trauma. There was a lot of things going on in my life. I had this just huge amount of rage that only years later did I understand what the rage, where the rage was coming from. And I remember in this specific episode, I was 17. It was the morning. I was heading off to school with my brother. And I remember that I, I had a problematic relationship with my father at that time. And I remember that I was just so angry for so many different things. I was very repressed. And I remember I got into an argument with my father and I don't even remember what the argument was about, but I remember that I just had just this deep rage and anger. And my father was a really conservative, very, very stoic, non-emotional kind kind of man. So the more that my father shut down, the more enraged I became. And I remember in this particular episode, I was just, just, I was just, you know, extremely angry. And I remember that I was about to walk out the door to go to school. And I remember that I just stopped and I turned around because I was so angry at my father and I wanted to kind of nudge it in. You know, I was just that really angry teenager. So I remember I turned around and I told my father something like, you know, I just cannot wait to be far away from you and from this house and from all of this. And I remember I said that at the moment. And I remember as soon as I said these words, my dad was having breakfast uh, at the table. He didn't even turn to me. He didn't acknowledge that he heard what I said, but of course he did. And I remember at that moment, I felt a couple of different things in me. The first part that I felt in me was I'm a really strong empath. So I felt at that exact moment, how much I had hurt him. But in the, on the other end, I was so angry at that moment that just kind of spitting all of that out at him, it gave me a sort of a temporary relief of the anger that I was feeling. So I had these kind of mixed emotions going on and I was just staring at him with so much anger. And I remember I turned around and I slammed the door and I took off. And I remember going down the street and I could feel a little bit of relief because I had just thrown all that out. At least I felt a little bit of relief from all of the emotions that were kind of coursing in my body. Well, fate would have it that hours later, my father died in the middle of the street in front of our house by himself. 
And so this conversation that he had with me was likely the last time he ever interacted with a human being. And I remember that when uh, people went to pick me up at school and I came home and I had just found out that my father had died suddenly, I remember standing in that same position right at that kitchen door and looking at the table where my father still had his coffee mug, <laughs> he, where he had had breakfast. And I remember I looked over and just this swirl of emotion came over me. And it was at that moment at 17 years old that I really came to terms with the consequences of what had just happened. And it was at this moment that I felt deep self-hatred and this self-hatred I carried for many, many, many years because what I had, what I had said, I couldn't take back. I couldn't take back in the most radical way, right? Because someone had just died and there was no way for me to make amends. There was no way for me to say sorry. And I remember standing at that kitchen door after this happened and, and after my father died and I was just looking over at his coffee mug and I remember feeling this just deep shame and guilt that really almost destroyed me because I carried this for so many years until my spiritual awakening. And so I know this is just a small story of, you know, one episode in my life that was really, really, uh, not just damaging, but this episode nearly destroyed me. Really. It, it, it just broke my heart on so many different levels. And I struggled with this for many, many years. So when people send me, if you have sent me an email, if you are struggling with guilt and shame, I know exactly how you feel and I'm sending you so much love. And that's why I'm shooting this video for you today. I am going to teach you exactly how I healed this particularly painful episode in my own life. And I'm going to do that by sharing a, a very specific seven step process that's going to help you to get from the place that I was in this deep self-hatred, guilt, and shame, loathing. I'm going to help you get from that place to a place of joy and lightheartedness. Okay. So let's get to the seven step process. All right. So step number one is to acknowledge your inner dialogue. Okay. So what does this mean? So emotions are, um, just a little background on emotions. Emotions are just energy moving, coursing through your body. Okay. That's essentially what an emotion is, no matter what the emotion is. It's just energy moving through your body and the energy can be really high vibration like love, or it could be really low vibration like guilt and shame. Okay. Guilt and shame are two of the lowest vibration emotions that a human being can emit. That's why they're so self-destructive. And that's why I'm shooting this video because I want to get you out out of these really self-destructive emotions. So this first, in this first step, what you're doing is you're acknowledging something really interesting. And that's this, an emotion can naturally spring up in your body and it can naturally course through and move around. But here's the thing. Emotions are by nature transient things. <laughs> okay. It's transient. Energy is always in movement. And so if energy is always in movement and an emotion is energy, then emotions are always in movement. So what ends up happening though, is when we hold on to an emotion, we actually stagnate it in us. Okay. So emotions can move naturally. They can be transient or they can be stagnated and repressed and blocked in us. And there's one reason why emotions become stagnated or they, they continue to be generated long after a specific event has occurred. And that is your inner dialogue. Okay. So emotions are sustained by thoughts. Okay. I want you to remember this because this is super important. Your emotions are transient. Normally, if you hold on to an emotion for an extended period of time, that's because there must be an inner dialogue an inner thought process that's feeding that emotion. It's sustaining it. Now this can be great or this can be not so great, right? Because if you're feeling happiness, for instance, and you continue to focus on the wonderful things in your life, you see that inner dialogue of focus focusing on the wonderful things in your life will continue to generate happiness and it'll continue to perpetuate it. And that's great, right? But if the emotion that's being perpetuated is a really dense, more um, self-destructive emotion like shame or guilt, 
then when you sustain it, you're really harming yourself. It's like you're poisoning yourself by continuing to perpetuate and to sustain these types of emotions. So this first step is very simple. It's just you acknowledging that if you're still holding on to really dense emotions like shame and like guilt, it must be because there is an accompanying negative inner dialogue, okay? So acknowledge this. Acknowledge that somewhere in my mind, I keep reviewing or I keep replaying or I keep repeating a very negative inner dialogue about this specific situation that happened. And that's what's sustaining the guilt and the shame, even sometimes years after this episode happened. Okay. So step one is pretty simple. Step one is just acknowledging that there must be an inner negative dialogue that's sustaining and perpetuating the emotion, guilt, and shame. So what kind of negative inner dialogue are we talking about? What are we talking about when we're, when we're talking about these negative thoughts that I'm, that I'm kind of repeating in my mind that's sustaining the guilt and the shame? Well, this is what I call <laughs> judgmental hindsight. <laughs> okay. I call it judgmental hindsight. And what this is, is it's your, your negative self thoughts. They are based on you looking back on the past, hence hindsight. Remember hindsight is 2020, that saying? It's very true, right? Like hindsight is 2020, but the judgmental hindsight is when you take your current self, right? Hindsight is 2020, meaning that now you look back with a different energy, you're more mature, you're more experienced than you were back then when whatever happened in your life that caused the guilt and the shame, you were a less mature person, you were a less experienced person. But when you're looking back on your past from your current, more mature energy, that's what I call judgmental hindsight because you're looking back on your past, but you're looking on your past from your current position of who you are now. And you're casting judgment on that person that lived in the past. So an example of that is I did that for years. I kept growing and maturing, but when I looked on that memory, on that specific memory of arguing with my father the day that he died, I looked at that 17 year old from my current position and look at how unfair that is, <laughs> right? Look at how unfair that is because the 17 year old had totally different tools and a different level of awareness than the 40 year old today me has, right? So when you look on the past with judgmental hindsight, you're really just projecting a really harsh judgment on that old person that doesn't even exist anymore. Okay. And it's this judgment that you're casting from your now position into the past. That's what feeds the, the negative internal dialogue. So the key to this first step is for me to realize, really internalize this and realize that the only reason that guilt and shame are still present and coursing around in me is because I am holding on to a negative inner dialogue because I'm looking on the past with judgmental hindsight. I'm looking on the past from my current level of awareness and that's casting a huge negative judgment on the person that I was before. The second step is called rewind. <laughs> okay. Now I picked this word on purpose and I'm going to tell you why. What rewind means is that you are going to, this could be in a meditation. It could be just in contemplation. I like to do this, this step in meditation. So what you're going to do is you're literally going to take your, your timeline where you are right now, and you're going to rewind it, rewind it, rewind it <laughs> like you would rewind a tape. And you're going to go all the way back to the episode or the phase in your life that you're guilty or shameful about. Okay. Now notice that I have used the word rewind. Okay. What does this mean? It's really important. The choice of this word, I did this on purpose because what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you not to put your current self back in the old person, <laughs> because that would again be judgmental hindsight. What I'm asking you to do is rewind your whole life and actually put yourself in that person's shoes that you were years ago. So in my case, I had to rewind from 40. I'm 40 now. I had to rewind all the way back until I was standing in that kitchen, having this argument with my father and I was 17 years old. Okay. Why is this step so crucial? 
Because when you rewind, as opposed to hindsight, when you rewind, what you're doing is this is an enormous exercise in compassion and empathy. You're immediately opening your heart because what you're doing is when you rewind, you're putting yourself back in that place, in that episode, in that phase of your life, but you're putting yourself back in that episode as you were. And you're going to sit there sometimes, you know, I love to do this in meditation. So I would close my eyes and I would just sit there and I would remember what that 17 year old felt, you know, in my case, just going back to my example, what, what did I feel when I was 17? How did I think about the world when I was 17? What was going on between my father and I, when I was 17, what was going on in my family when I was 17? Okay. You see, so you put yourself back, you rewind all the way back to the episode that is causing shame and guilt in you. And you, in that position, you're going to start studying. You're going to start observing. You're going to start understanding. Okay. The key to this step. And the reason that I'm asking you to rewind back to that specific episode is because I want you to start opening your heart and understanding. Understanding is a key in healing. Okay. So for me, this was super powerful because I went back to the 17 year old. I would journal a lot about this. And I remember, you know, I was just so really angry. My father was really sick and he wasn't taking care of himself. So he was basically killing himself slowly one day at a time. And I was really angry at him for that. I was really angry at him for all the suffering that he was causing to his family. And so there were all all of these dynamics going on in my family that were contributing to the anger, you see? So all of these things were, were happening. And when I, when I did this step two, I was able to come to a different level of understanding about who I was at that moment. And as soon as I started doing this step, my heart opened. I felt so much love and so much compassion and so much empathy for that person that no longer exists. But because I was able to rewind back, I was able to empathize with her, to understand her, to understand maybe why she said those things, why she was behaving towards her father in that way. So this is what step two is. Step two is the very important step of rewinding back to the, the time that, you know, the episode, the interaction, whatever is causing shame and guilt in you, you're going to rewind back to that episode or that phase in your life. And you're going to do this observation exercise where you open your heart and you begin to empathize with the character that you were way back when this happened. Step three. Now it comes next. And step three is what I call affirmations. So what you're going to do is now that you're in this meditation stage, hopefully you're doing step two, you did step two in a med meditation um, state. So now that you've gone through the rewinding, maybe you even journaled. I, I used journaling a lot for step two. So this is a recommendation for you when you're journaling and trying to understand you're doing the rewind step journal, write a lot about what that person, that old character that you were, what that person was going through and how they felt and how they were experiencing the world at that time. And then in step three, what you're going to do is you're going to add affirmations to the process. Okay. So you're going to add soothing affirmations that really help dissolve the, um, the tension and the, the, um, the charge. That's the word I wanted to use. It's going, these affirmations are going to diffuse the charge of the emotions, shame and guilt. So it, you make up your own affirmations, but the ones that I like to use a lot are, I said things like, you know, after going through the, the rewind uh, step, I started writing things like, gosh, you know, I was doing the best that I could at that moment. Um, my level of awareness was lower than it is now. I was just doing the best that I could. So something like this, right? Like that was, I was a wounded soul and that's why I wounded others. Okay. So do these affirmations, come up with your own affirmations. I really like the simple affirmation. I was doing the best that I could at the time. One simple affirmation. And I would repeat that so many times to kind of help diffuse the charge of guilt and shame. So that's what step three is. Step three is just figuring out the affirmations that are right for you. Even if it's 
just this one. I was doing the best that I could at the time. <laughs> okay. And you're going to repeat this affirmation, repeat it sometimes multiple times a day for the course of days. I did this for days and days and days. <laughs> okay. This isn't just a one time process. This can last days or weeks, this whole seven step process. All right. So that is step three, introducing loving affirmations into the situation that you are healing. Step four is called feel the pain. Okay. I'm not going to get too much into this step because I have another video popping up here where I talked about how you can heal the past. And one of the ways to heal the past, one of the steps in that, in that video that I talked about was how to feel the pain and sit with it. So, you know, make sure and check that video out for more details, but this step, this step four, feeling the pain is just simply that you are going to sit in whatever comes up as you are rewinding and doing your affirmation work. Okay. So as you rewind and you go into that, that phase of your life or that episode where you feel like you caused harm to someone else or what, when you go into the episode that has caused guilt and shame in your life, you're inevitably going to start feeling the pain, different emotions. It could be anger. It could be rage. It could be just sorrow and heartbreak. It's all going to come up because once you start to heal anything that you start to heal, you kind of, from an energy perspective, you start to shake it up. <laughs> and when you shake something up, all of the dirt comes up to the surface, right? So that's, what's going to happen in this healing process in this, in this specific healing process that I'm, that I'm sharing with you today. So step four is no matter what comes up, you are going to feel it and you're going to feel it without running away. Okay. So you're going to feel the pain, whatever it is, you're going to sit with it. You can journal about it. You can say, I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling sorrow. This, 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 I, I really journal a lot when I'm doing healing work. So this is something that I've repeated and it's something that I really recommend. So step four is simple in a sense, but it's hard in another, in another sense, because to feel the pain is extremely excruciating for so many of us. That's why we run away from pain. So in this step, what I'm asking you to do is you're going to sit in whatever pain comes up, whatever it is, whatever emotion you're going to sit and you're going to honor it. Okay. So that's step four. Step five is one of the most important steps in the whole process. And one that I love a lot and it's called implant love. <laughs> okay. Now, but before I explain to you how this actually works, I want to give a little side note. And that is, I want you to start thinking of linear time as an illusion. Okay. So we think of past, present, and future as on a line. The past is way back there. The future is way over there. And the present is right here, but linear time is actually a mental mental construct that exists in this time space reality. Okay. So linear time is an illusion time. The way that time really works is that the past, the present, and the future are superimposed points on top of each other. <laughs> so really in the now moment contains the past and the future. That's what I really want to get to. Okay. Now, why am I getting, giving this side note on time? The reason is because this step five implanting love, it's literally a step where you rewrite your past. <laughs> and I wouldn't be talking about rewriting your past unless I gave this side note about linear time, right? It's possible because the now moment contains the past and the future. Okay. So now on to the step five implant love. What you're going to do is when you're doing the, the rewind process, when you're going back to that memory or that specific phase that, that caused guilt and shame within you, what you're going to do is you're going to go through the scene, go through the characters. So in my example, I was standing in the kitchen, I was having an argument with my father. And then what you're going to do is instead of continuing the negative emotions that were coming up, like I remember feeling rage and anger and all despair and all these different things. What I did was I then shifted at that moment. I started implanting love in that specific memory. And how did I do that? <laughs> I did that by using a prayer or a practice that I love. It's called Ho'oponopono. It's a traditional Hawaiian forgiveness uh, uh, prayer, and it has four parts to it. And you can repeat the four parts of Ho'oponopono in any way that you want, but the four parts go like this. It goes, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Okay. So these are the four parts of Ho'oponopono. Say them in any order that you want. 
And so what you do during this phase of um, implanting love is you take yourself back to that memory. You're in that memory. Your, your eyes are closed. Hopefully you're doing this during meditation. Your eyes are closed. You're in that memory. You're feeling all of the things that you were feeling, all of the episodes, everything that was going on. And then you're going to start repeating Ho'oponopono. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And you're just going to keep repeating it. You could repeat the Ho'oponopono to a person in that memory. You can repeat it to yourself. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. So you can repeat this prayer within going to any, any place to a person or to yourself, or you can just repeat it in general. If you repeat this prayer in general, you're still implanting love because the prayer is a loving prayer. Okay. So you're just going to keep, you're going to be in the scene and you're going to be uh, talking. You're going to be repeating Ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And you're going to keep doing this. Sometimes you could do this for hundreds of times, you know, or dozens of times. You're going to keep repeating that mantra. The more that you repeat that mantra, the more your heart opens, the more you're kind of pouring love into that memory. And when you pour love into that memory, when you implant love into that memory, you're literally rewriting the past. By the time you finish step five, as soon as you start to do that Ho'oponopono over and over and over again, you're going to start feel an, feeling an immediate shift. That's really when the healing has, has occurred. The deep healing occurs is in this process of implanting love. <laughs> okay. So by the time you come out of step five, you're already going to be almost completely healed. And that takes us to step six. <laughs> step six is what I call follow up. Okay. So when you finish these first steps, by the time you get to step six, now you are going to do some sort of follow-up. Follow-up means action. Okay. So what does follow-up, what can follow-up include in your particular situation? Let's say that you really hurt someone you loved in the past. Okay. And let's say that person is still alive. It didn't happen to me, but let's say in your situation, the person is still alive. Okay. So one way to follow up is you can write them an email and say, look, I've been healing this situation. I know this happened years ago, but I've been healing this situation and I really wanted to reach out to you and I wanted to ask for forgiveness and I wanted to say how deeply sorry I am. And I wanted to explain a little bit why, you know, this happened and what I was feeling at the moment. And, and you know, I hope you can forgive me. I'm really sorry. Okay. So something like that. So the follow-up step for you can mean an email. It can mean reaching out to the person and having a heart to heart conversation with the person that you hurt. In my case, I didn't have that luck, right? Because my father died hours after I had this argument with him. So in my case, what this follow-up step looked like was I did a meditation where it was kind of a meditation ceremony. I called my father's spirit forward and I asked for his forgiveness and it was just this beautiful loving ceremony. So I did the heart to heart conversation is just that he was on the other side. He wasn't embodied anymore. Okay. So that's another example of a follow-up. If the situation that you're trying to heal has, has something to do with someone that has died, then this is a, this is a follow-up that you can do. You can do a ceremony where you call their spirit forward and you have a conversation with your spirit instead of having a conversation with the person alive. Okay. This could be one follow-up. Another follow-up is you can journal about it. You could write a letter and then burn the letter. So you could write a letter and not send it to the person. You don't have to reach out to the person or you don't have to, you don't have to go and have a heart to heart conversation. It depends on your situation. So this step, this follow-up step is going to be different for everyone, but you can write a letter and then burn it. Okay. The burning of the letter would symbolize that you are releasing the energy. Okay. That's what fire symbolizes in, in shamanic cultures is the fire just transmutes and purifies and all of that. So you can write a letter and then burn it. You can journal about the situation and then put the journal away or burn the journal. There are multiple ways in which you can do this follow-up step, but the core of the follow-up step is that now that you've done your internal work, now you're going to do some sort of action on the outside that's going to follow through your healing work. Okay. So this is step number six. With step number six, the follow-up step, this is really, it's not the last step in the process, but it's the last step in the healing process. Okay. So what do I mean by this? When you get to step six and you do the follow-up step, 
This really is the step that closes the energy loop, okay? So it closes the karmic cycle. Some people call it a karmic cycle. It closes, it basically just closes the door on the episode and what happened to the path in the past, okay? So step number six really signifies the end of that karmic cycle, the end of that cycle or phase in your life. When you complete step number six, it's done, okay? The healing work is done. Now to step number seven, and step number seven is the easiest one, I guess, uh, because it's it's a step that's occurring after you've already done the major healing work and you, you've closed out the karmic cycle and that major stuff is done, but it, it may seem like it's the easiest one, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> it's not because step number seven is going to require the full power of your conscious awareness, and I'll tell you why, okay? Step number seven is called monitor your thoughts. Now, what does this mean? I'm going to bring in a little bit of, of neurology and how the brain works now. <laughs> I'm gonna bring in a little bit of my clinical background into this conversation now. So when you uh, think a certain thought for a specific amount of time, whatever that thought is, your brain, you have to remember that your brain is an organ that it tries to understand what you are prioritizing and it gives importance to what it thinks you are prioritizing. So your brain will literally start building networks of neurons around a specific thought form, behavior, or whatever you give your conscious awareness to. Whatever you focus on, your brain thinks, oh, this must be important. And so when your brain says, oh, this must be important, what your brain does is it starts to solidify neurons, starts to create neural networks around that thought or that behavior or whatever you're giving your attention to. Now, this is how the brain efficiently uses its resources. This is prime real estate up here, okay? So the brain is always evaluating how, how it can work more efficiently. So in, in this particular instance, Remember when I was talking about how guilt and shame can only be sustained if you have a negative loop going on in your, in your mind, negative self-talk? Well, that negative self-talk has been actually solidified in your brain through the construction of neural networks. So that means that to think that negative thought after years of thinking it is easy because your brain has primed all of the neurons to come together and create these super highways of thought. So thinking that same thought becomes easy. That's why when you practice a skill, it becomes almost automatic. Like I'm thinking of someone practicing piano. The more they practice piano, the more they can just close their eyes and play piano because their fingers memorize the keys and all of that. Okay. Why? How does this happen? It's the brain constructing neural networks to make that behavior easier and automatic. The same happens with your thoughts. So when you think a specific thought, even if it's negative, when you think that thought repeatedly, your brain starts to rewire itself to reinforce the repetition of that thought. That's where your conscious awareness comes in for this one. Because if you've been stuck in a negative loop for years, you can't just expect to do this, you know, I'm gonna do this healing process that Christina's talking about, and yeah, I'm just gonna be complete, the, the negative self-talk is gonna be completely gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's not, how it's, that's not how it happens neurologically, okay? So in this step, what you're gonna do is, you're going to realize that it takes the brain weeks, months, sometimes years to restructure itself neural, neurally. I'm, I'm gonna take the years out and I'm gonna say weeks and months, okay? So I don't frighten you, <laughs> okay? So in this step, what you're gonna do is, you may, after you finish all of this healing work, you may be washing dishes one day and boom, the same negative self-talk about that past episode that you've healed, it's gonna start coming up in your brain. And at that moment, this is where step seven comes in. You're going to close your eyes, you're going to take a deep breath and you're going to realize, oh, I remember what Christina said, my brain is still wired for that negative loop, so what I have to do now is I'm going to refocus my attention. You see, this is the key. When you refocus your attention, and you can refocus your attention by using the mantras, the affirmations that we've used in this video. So when you when you catch your brain thinking about, you know, like in my case, when I would catch my brain thinking about, you know, you're such a you know useless piece of shit. How do you talk to your father like that? That's literally what my brain used to say to me. 
And, and when I went after my healing phase, when I, when I would catch that process in my mind, I would just take a deep breath. As soon as you take a deep breath, you immediately breathing the breath, paying attention to your breath cuts a thought process in, in, in its tracks. Okay. So I would take a deep breath. I would close my eyes and I would just revert back to one of my affirmations. And I would just say, I was doing the best that I could. That is healed. I'm done with that. So, okay, you see, you're going to revert back to your affirmations or any other self-talk that you want that's now positively inclined, okay? When you do this, when you refocus your attention on a different focus, so on your affirmations, on positive self-talk, on telling the brain that is healed, we don't need that anymore, that's healed, I was doing the best that I could, I'm a different person now. When you start this, now your brain is gonna say, wait a minute, she's not focusing on this negative thought that she was before, she's focusing on something else, so that must mean that she's giving priority to that other thing. So what the brain does is, the brain is so beautiful, what the brain does is it starts to pull the neurons apart from that neural network and it diverts it to the new neural network. It starts building a new neural network based on what your conscious mind is now prioritizing. Isn't that amazing? But this takes time, right? You can't expect the brain to be thinking something for years sometimes, the same thing over and over and over again. You can't expect it from one day to the next to just go, ba boom, here's a new thought process. That's not how it works, so you have to give it time. But you give it time and you are very, very aware of what's happening. The more aware you are, you just keep refocusing, refocusing. If you have to do this a thousand times a day, you do this a thousand times a day with compassion and with love and with kindness. And you'll find that as the days progress, your brain will start dissolving the old neural network and the, the new thought patterns will start coming in and you'll feel better. Your inner dialogue will get more positive and more positive and eventually all of those old thought forms will dissolve. <laughs> But now I want to hear from you. Have these seven steps been helpful in, um, you know, helping you process guilt and shame? Let me know in the comments below. And if you have a question that you want me to answer in my weekly videos, leave them in the comments with the hashtag AskChristina. Don't forget that hashtag. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Head over to my website where you can take my five minute heart quiz to find out if your heart is blocked and what you can do to open it. And check out over here. We got more videos for you coming up. I love you beautiful soul. I am out.